about um, analysis of BP oil spill tarballs, and all of us remember this explosion uh, many years ago. Not that many, but nine years ago. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Actually, almost that. It was April 20th, yeah. 2010. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so mm, basically, <laughs> what we want to know, how to actually see, how to determine if something what comes from the... Uh, as, uh, there are many oil contaminations, okay? If something comes actually uh, on the shore, and uh, how do we know that this comes from BP oil spill or maybe from something else, and what is exactly that? Okay, this is exactly what we talked about. Thank you, Dr. Franco. And as some of you noticed, I have like a slideshow going on here and my poster. The slideshow just has pictures on it that are on my poster, so I'm going to be talking about this and kind of flipping through the slideshow so maybe y'all can see that a little better. But as he was saying, I did analysis on tar balls from the BP oil spill, which most of you should remember. It was in 2010, Deepwater Horizon exploded. It was a really big deal. I want to say BP was sued for approximately $62 trillion, something like that. They lost a lot of money. And there was a big environmental impact on the marine life, on the wildlife on the shore, killed a ton of fish, killed a ton of birds, hurt all of those industries, the tourism industry, the fishing industry. So what our study did was we collected samples. By we, I mean people before me. I actually just analyzed these samples that were collected. So there was, there was a group of professors that collected samples over the years from the BP oil spill, just tar balls. They collected either tar mat samples, submerged samples, or dry samples. The submerged samples are just underwater, dry samples on the land, and the tar mat samples are actually this like mat of a ton of tar. It's not like just floating balls, it's like a whole mat of floating oil. So that is a, the red dots signify where all of the samples were collected over the years. Now, where I step in, I actually conducted analysis on these samples after numerous years of testing these samples before me. So I wanted to try and find a mechanism to kind of date these samples and say, okay, well these have been in a submerged environment for four years, or these have been in a dry environment for three years. And there's no way that we can accurately do that. So you kind of go in blind. You're like, okay, well what do I want to try first? So we went to IR to see if there was any difference in the spectra of these. And as you can see, on the top sample, it's just a flat line, the black line. But there's a dip on the left for each sample. That's an OH peak, an OH peak, a hydroxyl peak. And that just shows that there was oxidation in these samples over the years. But with that present, there's not really any significant difference because the bottom line is actually from 2014. And the blue line, the second one, is from 2010. So there's not really a significant difference in the four-year period there. You can just see that oxidation was present. So we couldn't use infrared to kind of say, okay, well, it steadily increases at this rate for a four-year period or anything like that. There wasn't any significant data for us. So we moved on to testing for GCMS, gas chromatography mass spec. And this is a graph of the actual just samples run before any kind of pyrolysis or decomposition. These are just the raw samples. We extracted them with dichloromethane because if you've never seen tar, it's really sticky. You can't really run it through a liquid testing machine without extracting it. So the top sample is the most weathered. It's from 2014. The bottom sample is just our original that was kept in the lab. And there's a big difference there, but there's nothing that you can analyze because all that's left by 2014 is just heavy, like, long chain, um, polymeric residue, and there's nothing that we can test for. We can't say, oh, okay, this is the correlation between the weathering and the environment. So what we tried next, we decided to do pyrolysis, and that's just thermal decomposition of these samples. You just heat them up to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time and then run the testing after that. What we had to do first was kind of find a temperature that would give us any kind of information to test with this GCMS. So we ran samples at different temperatures. <coughs> the blue line on this graph is at 440 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature we decided to stick with because if you go above that, there's too much decomposition. There's not enough left for us to test. We wanted to decompose it as much as we could without over decomposing it. So we stuck with that 440 degrees Celsius. We ran every sample at 440, 440 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes in a furnace. That's just me sticking them <coughs> in the furnace. We stuck one sample at a time in the tube, stuck it in the furnace. And this is after we had to take the air out of it because one time we didn't and it explodes if you don't take the air out of it like the 
they just goes everywhere and they have to clean it up. So <coughs> we had to take the, um, create a vacuum in the Pyrex tubing and then heat it for 30 minutes at that temperature. And after we did that with each sample, we ran GCMS on all of our samples. The left peak is actually the unsaturated peak, the right peak is the saturated peak. And what we found here was actually pretty interesting because over the years, this graph actually shows like 2010 is on the bottom, 2014 is on the top. They're actually both dry samples, so they were in the same kind of environment. And you can see a pretty significant difference in the peaks of these samples. So what this research showed is a difference in the ratio of the saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons. Now, for those of you who are not chemistry majors, it's totally okay if you don't know what saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons are. It's basically like a straight chain where every carbon can make four bonds. A saturated one is when it's attached to two other carbons and two hydrogens. There are no double bonds there. Unsaturated is where it has double bonds, so there's kind of some kinks in that chain. It doesn't make the straight chain. So... We found this significant because this kind of shows a difference in the degradation of these compounds over time. You see that there's obviously more saturated than there was unsaturated. And we don't know why, what would cause that, but we can say that there is that difference there. So we went ahead and we studied these ratios of the saturated to the unsaturated hydrocarbons over time. Now, on the right of this graph, those are just simple long chain hydrocarbons. We were just comparing their ratios with that, the ratios of the tar balls. As you can see, it's significantly different. They have many more unsaturated hydrocarbons. Wait, say that backwards? No, they have more unsaturated than they do saturated there. So their ratio is much less than one. It's about 0.5. Now, when you go to the tar balls, it increases over time. And you can see like a steady increase and that's what this experimentation is showing, that steady increase over time. Now, there are some outliers. There's a really tall peak. There's a really short peak. That could be due to weathering that we are unaware of because, as I said, these samples were simply just taken from the environment in 2010 versus taken from the environment in 2014. But we don't know exactly what happened to them in the environment. All we can say is they were taken as dry samples. They were taken as submerged samples. We don't know everything that touched those samples in the four years. So... Further testing, I'll just go back to that graph and leave it on. <clears throat> Further testing could show kind of what is actually happening to these tar balls to cause this difference. But to do such testing, we would have to like recreate the environment in a lab setting where we would recreate the submerged samples, recreate the dry samples, and the tar mat samples, and keep them in the lab for a five year period. It would just take the time to just let them sit there and experience that kind of recreated weathering and see if that ratio, the change in the ratio actually does continue in the same format. And in that way we could possibly come up with like an equation, some kind of correlation that shows, okay, we can find, we can go grab a tar ball out of the ocean right now and we could find the ratio of the saturated to the unsaturated hydrocarbons and we could say this tar ball has been here for four years. It has been here for five years just based off of that ratio. But that's where we're at right now with this. We thought about running, instead of just running it through a furnace, I don't know if y'all seen any of the research with how they're decomposing tires right now because there's a bunch of tires in the environment. They're actually running them through microwave decomposition to kind of break those bonds. So we thought about doing that. We actually ran a sample through just a general microwave for a long time to see if anything would happen. And there wasn't enough residue in the tube for us to test for anything significant through that testing. But if we were able to get kind of a bigger, a better microwaving machine to use and <clears throat> running more samples through it, we might be able to see some kind of residue there, but right now that's not looking significant. What looks the best is the GCMS running that gas chromatography and seeing the difference in that ratio, and we may be able to just correlate that with the environmental impact on these. So I'd just like to thank Dr. Bracco again and the Department of Chemistry and Geosciences for allowing me to do this research. And for y'all for letting me talk. So, do y'all have any questions about anything? Oh, <laughs> so, what is the level of um, sample collection that was that's been done in these different environments over the years? So these are just one or like just a small handful of samples from one region in 2010, or were there a number of that were actually taken and then? analyze as a replicate. Uh, 
There were several samples that were taken. There were several samples from each year. I believe, let me go back to this graph. This graph has the years that they were taken. Um, not pictured on this graph is whether they're dry or submerged or what kind of sample they are, where they're from. So there is a broad range of where they were collected and what year they were collected. But um, as you were saying, using the same samples for the kind of testing, is that what you were asking in the second part? Well, mostly from the same, like multiple samples from the mm -hmm. same environment, like mm -hmm. from the same location in which they were found, where there are more than one from that same regional area. So you're actually getting some level of, so you're not running the same sample through, you're running, oh, there's a toggle the over right area. here, and then there's a toggle over there, inside the same environment. Mm -hmm so that you could get replicates of the same environment that would have gone through mostly the same conditions, mm -hmm. but would have been two different samples from the same set. Okay, for that, I'm just going to go back really quick to kind of show this. Um, maybe I'll stay there. So they were from generally around the same environment. They did experience generally the same weathering. As you can see, we have some outliers down there in the Mississippi Delta area. And um, those were analyzed as well. It, would be interesting to try and, with, like, instead of recreating the environment, to do what you're saying and to have the different samples from that same kind of environment. But I don't believe that they were all taken from the same area. They were just the same general area, if that makes sense. I don't know if I answered all your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally okay, okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Mm -hmm. So you're looking to see if they are breaking down and causing less environmental impact. Is that what I'm, is that the purpose? Well, the purpose is not to see if they're causing less environmental impact, but let's say tar balls are still washing up on the shore. Right. And um, they could still be from Deepwater Horizon. They could be from a spill that's have like a current leak or something like that. Right. So the purpose is that we can see the environmental impact, that like how the environmental impact has impacted that tar rather than the tar impacting the environment. Okay. So that we can then go back and date how long that tar has been subjected to that environmental impact. So, so. basically, not reverse engineering, but just basically being able to tell how long that particular tar ball has been yes. in that environment. Yes, and, so, and hopefully we could also be able to tell like what it has been subjected to, what weathering, <laughs> see if it's been underwater for yes. this extended period of time, or see whether how long it's been on the beach, right. something like that. So. Okay. Is there a way to identify whether or not the tar ball is from a particular oil well or not? So no. I have a signature between <laughs> tar balls from <coughs> BP Horizon and those from, say, another one, another um, another oil spill <laughs> or even tanker ship. No, somebody asked me this um, at my last conference that I was talking about. Um, no, as far as I'm aware, there's not. The only significant difference would be the time that it's been out there, and we could say we know that Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred at this time, so we could kind of date it with the time and kind of sign or signify that this actually came from this oil spill just due to that time, if that covers it. That's the only way that I could think that we could possibly go about doing that. And then fingers crossed there hasn't been another Fingers you know, crossed, yes, yes. <laughs> giving you something, oh, so it was actually 2013, yes. 2014. Yes, and that's how um, I was, as I was discussing earlier, we could see kind of there may be leaks that we don't know about or something like that, you know, and we could date it to that specific date. And if there wasn't anything around that time, then we, that's where the question mark comes in. It's like, what? where did this actually come from if it didn't come from this bill four years ago. So let's thank our speaker again.